I need each and every day. I pray that you'll be right by my side, guiding me through the night to fight the good fight. Lord, when pressure's all around, burdens get me down, you're always there to pick me up. Welcome tonight to the All Souls Matter event. We pray that you'll be blessed by the message, that some of your questions and concerns will be answered by the speaker. If you have a question, please post your question in the chat screen. At the conclusion of the message, the hostess will retrieve the questions and pass them on to our speaker for consideration. We invite you to take this journey with us as we are committed to the concept that all souls matter. That's a conviction that recognizes the value of each and every individual and their value not only before God, but also before men. The Macalma Church of Christ is hosting this event as a Zoom format, and we ask you to take the journey with us. It's an ongoing revival, evangelistic, and community empowerment effort to provide spiritual enlightenment and stability during these difficult times. We call it a vaccine for the spiritual virus. It is manufactured by Heaven's Company, headed by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone can take part of it and buy shares in it. The price is a price that the Fed cannot print and the market cannot exploit. And each person can be benefited by the results of the messages and the camaraderie that we share in this venue. Everyone will be able to take advantage of the messages, make notes, as well as post your questions. During the message, however, please remain muted so that everyone can benefit from what is being said in our session tonight. This thing focuses on community outreach, membership empowerment, and evangelism. And we hope to make this a continuous effort as we've done since the beginning in January 2020. Right now, we want to pause and have a word of prayer before we bring our speaker up for this evening. We ask Brother Pete Eskew to lead us in our opening prayer. Shall we all together bow before the throne of God? And shall we all pray? one for another, to our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the God of all creation, to the God of all believers, to the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come humbly before your throne. We come, Father, because there is no other help that we know. We come, Father, thanking you for guiding and guarding us. We thank you, Father, for your provisions and your peace. We thank you, Father, for meeting every single need we have. Father, you compassionately supply all our needs. We are motivated to respond, Father, to your love and kindness with obedient faithfulness to your requirements. We come, Father, before your throne as living sacrifices to dedicate ourselves wholly to the service of the Master and to live every moment in a way that is pleasing to him. 
So we come, Father, set apart and pleasing the one who redeemed us, having our minds renewed, changing our thinking, our desires and our motives, and our expectations. Father, we come dedicated and devoted, thanking you for your word, which penetrates the hearts of honest men and women. It's given by your inspiration. It is a lamp and a light. It is spirit in life. It's like a hammer and fire. Father, we thank you for your word. It teaches us of your character and your concern for all mankind. It's for your glory and it's for our good. We come thanking you. We come thank you for your manservant that will come and break this bread of life. We ask that you remind him of the things that he have studied pertaining to you and your wonderful word. We are so grateful for your spirit, which you have sealed us and sanctified us. We're thankful, Father, foremost for your son and our Savior. We're grateful that he stood in our stead, dying for our sins, forgiving us of our sins, and then giving us a hope of glory. We're thankful. In the name of your Son and our Savior, we pray. Jesus Christ, thank you. And amen. 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 Thank you, Brother SQ, for that encouraging prayer, for including all of us in it. And we look forward to God answering that prayer, even as we study together on this evening. It's my good pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight, who will be speaking to us for some 35 minutes following uh, his introduction. And then after which, uh, we will proceed to questions and answers. Minister Travis Kidd has been preaching the gospel of Christ for 18 years. He has previously served as evangelist with Dawson Street Church of Christ in Nashville, Arkansas, Glen Church of Glenwood Church of Christ in Panama City, Florida, and Northside Church of Christ in Tampa, Florida, respectively. Brother Kidd currently serves as the minister at the Church of Christ downtown Little Rock, is married to the former Cassandra Wilborn, of Little Rock, that union has produced some six children. Brother Kidd obeyed the gospel at an early age under the leadership of the late Brother Elger Gilbert at the East 16th Street Church of Christ in Little Rock. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Religious Studies at Southwestern Christian College, a Master's degree in Human Resource Management from Webster University. He served his country proudly in the United States Army for 12 years, where he completed four uh, tour of duty in Desert Storm in October 1990 and 91. During this time in Florida, Brother Kidd was instrumental in helping to develop the community in Hillsborough County in Tampa, Florida. And during that endeavor, he successfully partnered with the Hillsborough Chef Department, the Boys and Girls Club, Housing Authority, and the County Commissioner to develop an after-school recreational center for children in the community. This was done in honor of, Fred, of Freddie Salomon, an accomplishment that Brother Kidd is extremely proud of and one which he hopes to duplicate in the Little Rock area. In just a moment, he'll be speaking to us on the subject, not conform to this world. Brother Kidd, the Macalma Church of Christ is thankful that you've accepted our invitation. We're glad to have you with us tonight. And of course, uh, we invite you now to take charge of the podium. The podium is yours. You're muted, sir. Don't forget you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Awesome. I want to thank you, and I'm truly uh, appreciative to uh, have the invitation to come and to participate 
uh, in the series of topics that all souls matter. Uh, I'm honored and truly elated uh, to be in fellowship and to fellowship with the saints of Nagama and all of those who are joining us on this platform. Uh, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time. Uh, the topic that was rendered to me uh, is uh, be not conformed to this world. And of course, this topic is coming from Romans chapter 12, verses uh, two, in which I would like to read for the sake of emphasis, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, where uh, these words are found. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Along with the topic, be not conformed to this world, I would tag a subtopic or sub a subject to it, which would be for mercy's sake. What in the world do you want? <laughs> for mercy's sake, what in the world do you want? You've heard that term before and coming up when you're calling your mother, at least I have, calling my mother and I know and keep calling her and calling her. Finally, uh, she say, boy, for crying out loud, what in the world do you want? And I believe when we think in terms of that and in respect to the topic, uh, when we gauge into our topic concerning mercy, God's mercy, what in this world will we embrace over the mercies of God? Just for a few moments, uh, just giving a, a quick backdrop here, Paul does an excellent job in explaining the gospel in his own way. And when, by the time he gets there to uh, chapter eight, he begins that chapter by saying, there's therefore no condemnation to those who walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And then in chapter nine, he kind of pauses and kind of vents a little bit, nine through chapter 11, he vents and he expresses that his heart is heavy for his kinsmen because uh, they have rejected the righteousness of God. And uh, uh, Paul continues there and expressing how the Jews had it wrong. The Israelites uh, had it wrong because they thought they were in good shape with God because uh, they were of the lineage, fleshly lineage of Abraham. And then they thought that they was in good standings with God because they did the works of the law. And in chapter 10, Paul continues, he said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For he bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they have rejected the righteousness of God, uh, uh, that they have not uh, submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They've gone about to establish their own righteousness. But when he gets to chapter 11, he warns the Gentiles, and I believe that the Gentile converts are those who he are really addressing in our text here. Uh, he, he warns them not to boast, uh, being grafted in, uh, uh, and the Jews have been cut off. And he used like a little uh, example of the Jews being natural branches and the Gentiles being wild olive branches. And he expressed that uh, God's wisdom is at play here where he brings the Jews to jealousy by bringing in the Gentiles and the Gentiles should not boast because they were grafted in and the Jews was cut off. Uh, and by the time we get to the end of chapter 11, he uh, expresses that God have not forsaken the Israelites 
In verse 26, he says, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sake. For the gift and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in time past, as he's speaking concerning the uh, Gentiles, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy. Get this, have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all, Jews and Gentiles, in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And then he goes into a, into a praise summit where he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory. Then we get into chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul then says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Notice how he acknowledged even Gentile converts as brethren, for they are brothers in Christ Jesus. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now, the mercies of God. This comes from a Greek term, optimus, which points to uh, a feeling God had for the sad and unhappy condition and circumstances of humanity. God felt compassion for humanity. He had compassion for, com for humanity. Now, this is not to be uh, confused with Elios, where Elios is also a feeling, but it was a feeling that moved God to act upon uh, man's unhappy circumstances. And the unhappy circumstances that humanity found themselves in, both Jews and Gentiles, is that they were all shackled in sin, uh, condemned to die. And so here, when we talk about God's mercy, God felt mercy or felt compassion for humanity before he had compassion for humanity. He felt compassion. And from his feelings, then God had compassion that moved him to act on man's behalf without man having to prompt him to do it. And so now uh, Mercy has a twin brother. And that twin brother, they're not uh, uh, identical twins, but they're brothers. And that's Grace. And if mercy, figuratively, if mercy and grace had a mother, it will be love. And so uh, when mercy and grace interact together, they compose an atmosphere of peace. And so here God, standing over and looking at humanity, he felt pity for man. Then he Elios man, he had mercy or had pity for man that he did something about it. And he dispatched his son to come and to die on the cross for all mankind. So one thing that the Jews and the Gentiles had in common, that they both were lost and they both were in need of God's mercy. Now, when God gives his mercy, and mercy could be best described as that which God withhold that we deserve. His grace can be best described as that which God grants and which we do not deserve. And so 
uh, when God displayed his mercy, there had to be something to follow. If God going to withhold judgment or justice, he withholds justice and fill it with grace. And you can hear uh, uh, God's mercy and grace uh, could be implied right there in John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he had compassion. He so loved the world mercifully that he gave gracefully through grace, he sent his son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, Paul is saying, because God has shown his acts of kindness, uh, we should present our bodies, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, notice that the body has to be something given. When we notice there in Matthew chapter 22, and verse there uh, would be verse 37, where Jesus says this. He says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then when we notice there in 1 Corinthians, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, Paul says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so uh, Paul helped us to understand that we have to present our bodies before God a living sacrifice. We present uh, ourselves in a particular way. We can't come to God. We don't offer God uh, our bodies a living sacrifice or offer ourselves before God with blemishes and spots. God did not receive those kinds of uh, and did not command those kind of offerings to him with animal sacrifices. They had to be uh, without spot or blemishes. And I believe that this is how we are to offer ourselves to God for his wonderful acts. So how then shall we present ourselves? Paul said that we should offer, that we should present our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy. Holy, and it means to be perfect without blemish, not being tarnished by worldly defilements, and uh, we have to come to him morally sound. Uh, so he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. One, holy. Two, acceptable unto God. This is what God accepts. He says, which is your reasonable service? And reasonable comes from the Greek word logicos, uh, which we derive reason, how we reason. Uh, if someone does something for you, the logical thing for you to do is say thank you. That's the logical thing. And that's reasonable. Uh, it shows forth your thanks to an individual by way of word for what they have done for you without you even prompted them to do it. And so our reasonable worship to God in the best way in which we could show our gratitude, our thanks to God is by offering ourselves to God. 
for we belong to God. And since we belong to God, we have to set ourselves aside and away from the world and present ourselves holy, without spot, without blemish, morally sound before God. This is our reasonable worship to God. And he tells us then how to do that. And Paul says in verse number two, and be not uh, and be not conformed to this world. Conformed to this world comes from the Greek term suskematizo, which means fashion. And it's, this term is used twice in the New Testament. You can find it uh, uh, there in uh, First Peter chapter one. First Peter one, verses thirteen. Uh, through 16, where Peter himself actually used the term uh, fashion. But there in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, beginning there at verse number 13, uh, Peter says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, get this, not fashioning, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So if I could say this in other words concerning be not conformed to this world, I believe Paul would say stop being molded by the external and fleeting fashions of this age. And so we have to purposefully uh, move to transition from uh, worldliness to holiness. He says, be not conformed to this world. So if you're not going to be conformed to this world, there is something for us to conform to. So he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How do we transform ourselves? By the renewing of our minds. So we think in terms of transform, metamorpho. Uh, transform from one image or one state of being into another. And so we have to transform ourselves. And this has to be done by the renewing of our mind. This is where we're putting away the old man. Uh, uh, this is something that Paul mentions there in Romans uh, 6 and 6. But notice there in Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Romans chapter eight, verses six and seven, uh, Paul says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why is that? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And so, but Paul's mentioned to the hearers there in Rome, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so there have to be a transformation that takes place where you're transforming uh, yourself from within changing from worldliness and worldly views to spiritual. Uh, this is how God is transforming us and making us new creatures. And we have to participate in that transformation. And the way we do that is renewing our mind, the mind. We have to renew our mind. And everything dealing with Christianity, it begins from the neck up. 
So everybody have to uh, get a checkup from the neck up before they mess up and get burned up. <laughs> and so here we find that the renewing of our mind is like a renovation, a transformed uh, from one place to another. And we can clearly uh, see this there, what Paul is saying there in Ephesians. Notice there in Ephesians chapter four. As I rush to get there. Ephesians chapter four, verses uh, 17 through about 23. Listen to what Paul says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Uh, and it says, uh, and be renewed, get this, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So everything that we do, we have to move to change uh, our mind, and that comes by way of repentance. Every Christian should always be in the mode of repentance, and that simply means that whenever you realize or whenever you find that you are wrong or living wrong or doing wrong, God has granted you life whereby you can change your mind, changing your mind, repentance, turning from that which is wrong and embracing that which is right. So what God is really doing here, what Paul is really teaching the Gentiles in this text, and really it's about relationship, how they are going to interact with the Jews and how the Jews will have to interact with the Gentiles and, and how they are not to continue on embracing Embracing the things that they are so accustomed to. You have to renew their mind. Notice what Peter says there in 1 Peter 1 and 13 once again. And I'll just read that again for the sake of emphasis. In verse 1, 13, Peter says this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're dealing with the mind, the mind. Uh, the mindset of the individual. Some people, when they were baptized, they kind of stored away the old man, put them in a closet until it's convenient to bring them back out. If someone hurts you, you kind of knock him out. And then when, when you feel hurt or feel someone cross you or wrong you, you go in there, get the, get the smelling sauce, you put in the, the old man's nose, he wake up and you let him loose again out of the closet. You really haven't destroyed the old man. You just tucked him away until it's time to bring him out. And I think this is one grave mistake that Christians make. Uh, being serious about their transformation. If you've been in Christ at some period of time, this is a growth process. It is a process that you have to continue on until your journey ends. And putting away that old man, what God is really doing as you are shedding off certain clothes, what God is really doing, he is making you a new creature. This is what God is doing in the, in the lives of Christians. Notice what he says there in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 through 18, uh, he says this, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. 
and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, get this, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are made are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in verse 9, he says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so while we were in our sin, Christ died for us, broke the shackles of sin off our feet. Now we have a right to live a life unto the Lord, not living a life unto ourselves, because if we start living a life unto ourselves, then we'll be living in a self-righteous way. We're governed by what is right to us. Maybe not what's necessarily right with God. And so our objective is to live our life that's pleasing and acceptable to God. And what is acceptable to God is that we offer ourselves to him wholeheartedly. We offer ourselves to him, live our life purposefully to turn from the ways that we are so accustomed to. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is the hardest thing to do. And that is change. Change for some people is hard. It's difficult. Change for some people to change from uh, their ways. Some people came up. <laughs> we in Little Rock. Some people came up in Southwest. I did. We came up in Southwest Little Rock. I remember a time when I was uh, out in the streets and, and living my life a way in which Hey, I thought I was I was doing the right thing. You know, I, I got in many fights, won some, lost some. I lost fewer than I won. <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, I thought I was doing the right thing. But what was right to me wasn't necessarily right with God. And so I had to change. A change had to come about. When I obeyed the gospel, I realized now I have another outlook on life. I have a new chance at life. And that new chance, as I began to change my mind, God was changing my state. And so this is the process. God has a part to play in it, and we have our part to play in it. Our part in which we control, we control ourselves in the sense that we can offer ourselves to God. We can control whether or not we live holy lives. We can control whether or not we live our life that is acceptable before God. We have to bring our mind on a subjection to the will of God. We can control that. A lot of times you can't control what comes into your mind but we can control what stay on our mind. And the thing that stays on our mind will determine which have the most influence on us, whether the spirit or the flesh. Listen to what uh, Paul says there in Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six, oh, somewhere about verse number, uh, verse number 16. Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Paul says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, rather of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. 
being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So we are like puppets on a string. And there are two puppeteers fighting for our influence, to influence us. Uh, you have sin on one hand, which is unrighteousness. And then you have righteousness on the other hand. The problem with the Jews then, the Jews live, uh, rejected the righteousness of God. They rejected Christ. And so they were cut off. And the Gentiles grafted in to bring the Jews to jealousy with hopes that the Jews would then see the righteousness that are in the Gentiles will come to jealousy and then render obedience to the righteousness of God. So Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I ask you today for mercy's sake, what in the world do you want? <laughs> I hope that something was said that will help, and I hope that I have added to the quality that is already in these series of topics that will help you on your journey. I don't know if I superseded my time or if I have some more time. I have more to go, uh, but if if I have superseded some time, uh, I will cut it off and leave way for some questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let's take the questions and then if there are more time, we'll come back to you for that. But uh, we may have some questions for you, if you don't mind answering those first. Sure. Uh, Maggie, do you have questions? I do have some questions for Brother Kid. Hold on just a second. Let me take you off, Brother Harris. Okay, hold, please. I had it up, and now I lost it. So the first question is, TV has become an enemy to us as Christians because over half of the things that we watch are sinful in God's sight. Does that keep our minds conformed instead of transformed? You know, that depends. You know, I've always said there's nothing wrong with, for instance, when we talk about hip hop, for instance, there's nothing wrong with being into hip hop. But it's something wrong when hip hop gets into you to the point that it begins to shape the way you think and the way you act. And with our youth today, this is such a critical thing, the things that has become such a normity in the world. When I'm talking about normity, I'm talking about, uh, you know, a lot of kids are emboldened to carry pistols because they hear that kind of rap on the radio, when you're talking about homosexuality, you see it's such a normity on TV and it shows that it is all right uh, when homosexuality is not all right. And so uh, we have to really gauge on what we see and watch on television because yes, television actually program, especially our youth uh, whose minds are still developing and they watch their favorite cartoon shows or their favorite sitcom or their favorite movies. I think parents should be right there watching to monitor the things that television is uh, putting into the minds of our children because it plays a, a vital role in the development of their mind and how they perceive the world and how they perceive things around them. Okay, so our next question is, how can we teach our young children not to be conformed to this world when society teaches the desires of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life? 
And this is where uh, the churches have to be more involved. Uh, uh, and the parents have to be more involved in having daily conversations with their children. Don't just let them, you know, you come in from work and you're tired and uh, and the only thing we say to them, have you done your homework? Yeah, they, the homework is done and they go to bed. I think that we have to be in touch with what's, what's going on in society, in our communities, uh, and understanding what's going on. It should, the things that we see and understand, we should take the things that we see and help our children to understand what's going on and how that affect, how it will affect them with their relationship with God. Most kids do not understand why they even breathe. Some think that they're breathing to play football or to play sports, well, that's good stuff, uh, you know, extra stuff, curriculum. But the main reason that they're here is to know God and to understand his will and to grow up in Christ and to develop as fine Christians and then be able to influence friends uh, likewise. But parents have to do their part. We have to understand that same thing and to be able to uh, translate that and help our children because God have left parents in charge to bring the children up the part in knowing who they are and Lord knowing who he is. And so in knowing that, uh, we have to play a very important role in educating, educating our children. When we're talking about drugs, they need to be educated and understanding the cons in dealing with drugs, alcohol, uh, premarital sex, uh, uh, and different things that the world looks at as a good thing, hanging around the wrong crowd, going to wild parties. You know, these are some of the things we need to kind of educate our children while they're under eye care and being able to uh, shield them from that. But not only our children, but we have to also be in touch with our own weaknesses. Because there are some things that we're weak about, that we're weak to that we need to be in touch uh, with our weaknesses and steer away from the things that we know could easily trip us up. Okay, so the next question is, as Christians, how can we minimize the effects of the world around us when it tends to surround us or we tend to let it enlarge our life daily? Now, I know that's, that's a great question. One thing that I focus on and is a great teaching point on that because everything has to evolve around God. God uh, controls and if we give God our strings to control, he's gonna guide us safely through many obstacles. I think of Hebrews chapter 12 where the Hebrew uh, writer writes this, wherefore seeing we are, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do us so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How do we do that? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So I believe what we have to do in education, education is center point. Educating people how to look unto Jesus. Educating uh, the church, the community, that what they are really looking for is peace. Mm. Peace, not the peace that the world given, but what they're really looking for is the peace that Christ offers. And so the peace that Christ offer is lasting. But get this, the peace that the world offers is temporal. So some people find that relief behind a whiskey bottle, but after the whiskey is gone and they come off their hangover, they find themselves in that same dragged out state of being and feeling even worse with a headache. Uh -huh. But the peace that Christ gives, the peace that Christ gives is eternal life. And to know that you are set for eternal life, he is able to put blinders on you so that the distractions that are in the world won't distract you from focusing on Christ. You remember when Jesus walked on water 
And Peter said, Lord, is that you? Let me come out there where you are. And, and Jesus bade him to come. And Peter stepped on out on that water. The water was boisterous. And, and Peter was doing his thing until he took his eyes off Christ and began to look around and say, what in the world am I doing? And when he realized he was actually walking on water, he began to sink because he began, he was fearful. And when he began to sink, he said, Lord, save me. And the Lord reached out and picked him up and brought him to the shore. But Peter took his eyes off God. And I believe that we are so easily sidetracked by little things. Now, football could be a side distraction. People come to church and, uh, you know, uh, they, they come in looking at the watch. Brother Harris preached a little bit past 1130. You know, that's pre that's the free time show. We're distracted. We're ready to go. But little things such as, you know, peer pressure with our children. They have friends whose parents may not be in the church or may not be Christians or have not come up on Christian values. And so their friends are in, and, and I'm, I was guilty of that when I was coming up because when I was coming up, I had to be home before the night lights came on. But the night lights came on about eight o'clock. My, my friends were still hanging out around about 10 to 1030, 11 o'clock. But my cutoff time was the night lights. And so peer pressure got to me and I, I, I went on with the friends and I had to endure a couple of whippings. Now, I had different levels of whipping. The first level was the belt, second level switch. But that third level is the extension card. That's the one that broke the camera's back. I came home way before the night lights. And so my point that I'm making is, is that we have to remain focused on Christ. He is guiding us safely through the storms. He's not going to take us out of the world. We're not asking him to remove the mountains. Just give us the strength to climb, to overcome. In fact, to be a true follower of Christ, we have to be overcomers. And to overcome, we have to follow the path of the Lord and not try to trailblaze our own path because that's a path that's already been trailblazed and we just have to stay on course, but stay focused on God. And that is done by way of teaching, continue to teach, and don't ever stop teaching. And stay on the same subjects uh, that is plaguing our children. We need to teach them about know how wrong homosexuality is because that is really blowing up uh, and as well as marijuana, drugs. Uh, our kids are, many of them and many people are walking around like zombies because they are entangled in that tangled web of deceit from the devil, entangled in drugs. Uh, don't mind killing. They, they have no second thoughts about killing. And so we have to teach our children. We have to be taught. And I believe the church, as well as parents, play a vital role in educating the community, educating the members in the church, educating our children, uh, and to safeguard our homes. And I, I believe that's uh, one way of, of overcoming the distractions that are in the world. Okay, next question. Uh, but before I go into the next question, we never look at our clocks when Brother Harris is preaching. Oh. I know it. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> okay. Just want to make that clear. So what are some ways to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ referenced in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5? Now read that question again. What are some ways to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ that's referenced in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5? Well, one thing for certain that, uh, that I believe that we could do is understanding how we come into captivity. In other words, how do we trip up? Uh, and this goes back to understanding and being in touch with yourself, understanding your weaknesses and your strength. Uh, the devil is never going to come at us at our strength, at our strong point. He's going to always come at us at our weaker point, whether it's through our children uh, or, or whatnot. But one thing that uh, I think of, let's see if I can find uh, that text. Um, I 
I want to, where is that? Oh, I can't find it right now, but I want to look at it in the sense that to bring our mind under captivity. And when we think in terms of that, uh, it have to be subject uh, uh, under the ruleship of Jesus Christ. And that comes with meditation. It comes with a purposeful uh, driven life. You have to purposefully uh, act. It doesn't come to you uh, and, and just, you know, you're endowed with the strength to overcome. You're going to have to bring your mind under subjection, but you have to do it on purpose. But to do it on purpose, you have to notice how the devil operates. Everything in which the devil will, will tempt us will be by way of the lust of the eye, pride of life, and so forth. But if there's a P, if anyone has a PhD and above to the umpteenth degree, the devil have it on every individual. And he knows exactly your weak point. And he's going to come at you at that certain angle whereby he can try to blindside you, whether it's through the children, loved ones, or even your enemy who is boldly approaching you in your face. You have to purposefully seek out God's righteousness in the midst of chaos, in the midst of temptation. Remember how the how God, how Jesus handled it when the devil came to tempt him. Uh, and even the devil tried to trip him up on scriptures. But Jesus always began his response with, it is written. And so I believe that we begin to bring our mind on objection by dealing with what is written and having that knowledge for this is one thing that the uh the Israelites messed up on. They had a zeal of God, but it wasn't according to knowledge. And so one way of bringing our mind to subjection, we have to have the knowledge to do it. When you have knowledge, knowing is half the battle. When you have the knowledge, now you've got to make it applicable to your personal lives. Uh, and therefore, when you do that purposefully, you're resisting the devil. And when you resist the devil, he's going to depart, but come back on this side, you uh -huh. see. And so you repeat that whole process. It begins with what is written, educate your mind and what is written, and then act upon what you know. When you act upon what you know, you have to do it purposefully. If you do it purposefully, then eventually you will find yourself overcoming a lot of small battles. By the end, you have overcome major battles. And I think that this is how it, it, it must begin. Meditation and prayer. Prayer to God. What we pray to God for. We give him thanks because God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. We have to use what he has given us. We have time for a lot of stuff. But do we have time to educate ourselves, to guard ourselves from the tactics of the devil? He is real. He is in the world. We see the evidence of him. But righteousness is present as well. And we see the evidence of righteousness also. Okay, next question is, what is the issue when Christians stay carnal? When they stay carnal? Uh-huh. Well, many Christians, and you hear the Bible say there are a lot of people that are ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth. Uh, I, now, some places where I have preached, you, <laughs> you have people that have been in the church for 30-some years, they don't mind telling you. But the fruit so shows that they still on milk. They have not grown. And the reason people are stuck in a carnal mind or with a carnal mind because they have not crucified that old man. He's in the closet. And all it takes is an opportunity for them to open a closet door and let the old man out again and there he goes. When the old man comes out, he comes out twofold. And so I think that 
it is a process. Our spiritual growth is a process. And whenever we get to the to the point where we feel we have arrived, that's when we begin to shrink. We got to forever strive to gain more knowledge, to understand God's will more perfectly, but most importantly, to apply the things that we know purposefully in our everyday lives. When we do that, then we are able to, to move uh, and maneuver in this world in a way uh, that is, you know, that is pleasing before God. Case in point, in James, James chapter one, listen to what James says here in James chapter one, beginning at verse 13. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot uh, be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. But get this, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so I believe that uh, we are only uh, driven away or uh, moved aside when we are distracted. The devil can, uh, when we're not in touch with our weaknesses, when we're not educated on the will of God, what God uh, wants for his uh, service to do, uh, when we are not educated, how then can we uh, do the right thing when we are not uh, we, we, we do not have the knowledge of the right thing to do. Now, there is uh, the difference between right and wrong. And this is what it's really all about, is being able to embrace the righteousness of God uh, versus unrighteousness. It's a choice that we all have. And this is what life is all about. Life is all about making choices, making decisions. And I tell my children all the time, you know, uh, now that you're of age, the whoopings are over for me. Only thing I can do is serve on your board of advisors. And so uh, they have to establish an advisory board. And if they give ear to sound advice, it will prevent them from bumping into or falling to pitfalls uh, that many have fallen in. And I also tell them to observe their, their, their surroundings. Look at what's working for some people and, and notice how others are falling in pitfalls. Analyze how they fall in that pitfall. And, and note that and make sure that you do not follow in those same footsteps. I share my personal pitfalls that I've fallen into with my children and, uh, and, 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 I, and I share with hopes that they don't make the same mistakes that I have made in my life uh, that have uh, lured me further away from the Lord versus drawing me closer to him. I don't even know if I asked your question. <laughs> well, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Great <laughs> job, sir. Great job. Thank you. You probably answered two or three questions we didn't ask. <laughs> all right. That we, we can use the answers. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It has been a great privilege. And I, Really enjoyed this, and I I, I sometimes come on and and poke my head in at times where I can't come on. It, it's so good to, that you guys have it on your archives. I'm able to go in there and visit uh, some of the previous topics that has been most helpful. And uh, I appreciate MacAlma for the job that you guys are doing in the community, in the state of Arkansas, in Little Rock, Sherwood, and all over. And brother Harris, I really appreciate you, my brother. Uh, you don't know, but I watch you from afar. When I was going to Southwestern at the uh, Crusade for Christ, uh, my mentor was uh, Dr. Maxwell and uh, used to travel with him a lot and carry his books and, <laughs> and everything. But uh, it's, it's been a pleasure and it is a pleasure uh, to know that uh, now that I'm back in Little Rock, uh, I'm, I'm able to uh, participate in, in such uh, uh, programs that you have going right now. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're glad that you are here with us tonight and we appreciate the enthusiasm as well as the, the genuineness of your presentation tonight and the fact Thank that you. you actually hit the nail on the head. We appreciate that. I Amen. know that uh, we are coming near the end. I do want to mention, uh, Robin, that the 
Mike Alma will be hosting the Labor Day lectureship on September 5th and 6th. And we'll be getting more information about that in our next presentation. Um, let's see. We've, uh, before bringing us to the end, let me mention what's coming up down the road. Uh, on next week, August 24th, The Role of Fathers by Dr. Willie Nellis. And then on August the 31st, How to Restore Lost Sheep by Brother Carlos Page uh, from Biloxi, Mississippi. And then uh, right now we're looking at uh, sep uh, September the 7th. At that time, we are uh, planning a panel discussion uh, for All Souls Matter. And uh, we'll bring you more details about that when we come back next time. That's what's coming up down the road. And we look forward to having you join us for these exciting presentations. Uh, before uh, we conclude, we're going to pause for our final prayer. And I'll ask Elder Theodos King to lead us in that prayer. Shall we pray together? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for permitting us to be in this uh, presentation this evening and for Brother Kidd in the way he uh, answered questions and the presentation. We ask that you continue to bless him and keep him in your care. And Father, we pray that the things that we've heard tonight to help us in our transformation, that we will embrace them, not only embrace them, but allow them to be a part of our lives that we might be acceptable to you. And we just simply say thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for walking with us and even tolerating and putting up with us each day of our lives. And we realize that these things are not because of our goodness of our righteousness, but it's because of the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. And we sincerely say thank you. Be with us. Continue to bless uh, the All Souls Matter effort. And Father, we pray that out of all the things we do, you receive the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And Maggie, we are back in your hands. All right. I hope so. Okay. So thank you to Brother Kid for his message tonight on not being conformed. I think Brother Harris was right. It was very genuine and from the heart. So uh, thank you for that message. And thank you to everyone that joined us tonight. So our presentation will be posted on our website, which is www.mcalmancoc.org. And there's also a link in the Zoom chat for our Zoom participants. So please share so that others can hear this wonderful message from Brother Kid. So once again, thank you all for joining us tonight and we will see you all next Tuesday at 6.30. Everyone have a great night. Thank you again, Brother Kip. Good night. Good night.